When you find yourself in conflict with someone else, what do you do? Do you find a way to resolve the conflict peacefully in a way that attempts to meet both your interests? Maybe it depends who you're arguing with and why. If the person seems reasonable and willing to listen, you probably treat them the same and try to meet them halfway. That's because you respect others and their autonomy. If the person doesn't care what you want and attempts to impose their will on you over your objections, you might get the urge to fight them. That's because they don't respect you or your autonomy. This channel is all about freedom and oppression. I look at how power works and how it destroys freedom. In our time, political power is concentrated in the state, represented by the government. States are our greatest source of death, destruction, and chaos. This video is about why. Today we're going to learn how the state works and how it thinks, why we live in such extreme times, why Israel is currently invading Rafah, and how people propose to resolve the war on Palestine. We're going to learn all that by learning about two opposing forces, escalation and decentralization. I'm Chris, and welcome back to the show that's even more fun than going to church. Last week, I pointed out that being an authority, not the kind that knows things, but the kind that's in charge, means that you have the entire enforcement apparatus of the state behind you. Using that power is known as authoritarianism. States are authoritarian social systems that set up social hierarchy. So through school, media, and other institutions, they foster in their subjects an authoritarian mindset. Authoritarians, whether agents of the state or civilians without institutional power behind them, might choose to escalate a conflict, maybe ramping up the rhetoric, raising their voices, getting rough. Escalating is an effect of wanting to impose one's will on another. States are institutions designed for escalating conflicts. States centralize power, which means taking power away from people and concentrating it in institutions like the cabinet, the courts, the police, and the bureaucracy. People with access to the power of those institutions don't like giving it up. You might have noticed people will commit any kind of violence they can get away with to take or cling to whatever power over others they can. Having power means killing the freedom of others for one's own personal benefit. Those of us who don't strive for power care more about freedom from other people's control, our ability to choose our life for ourselves, and the freedom of those around us to do the same. We resent losing our freedom and living forever at the mercy of a merciless system. So we resist. Being under the constant threat of violence in the name of the law, we usually start the attempt to resist by asking nicely, which in a state society includes submitting petitions and participating in elections. But through the bitter experience of countless attempts to change things, we learn if powerful people could be swayed by politeness, they wouldn't need power. We could just discuss your proposals in the marketplace of ideas or the grocery store of imagination. But if the powerful have already made the decision, we need more than words to stop it. So people resist with force. At this point, most people I know get queasy. I mean, I hope they find a way to free themselves, but by force? Isn't it always wrong to use force? If so, you should be opposed to the existence of the state. Everything the state has, everything it does, is a product of force. The state imposes certain ways of thinking on its subjects in order to legitimize everything it does. And on most people, for most of their lives, it works. One result of our indoctrination is we don't see state violence as violence. We see it as the will of the people or what our leaders have decided for us. Only illegal violence is bad. Unsurprisingly, any form of resistance that has the remotest chance of being effective is not only widely frowned upon, but illegal. If you don't believe me, you might not be aware of how long it was illegal to unionize and strike, and what happened to people who tried it. You might not be familiar with how police treat efforts by indigenous people to defend their land. You might not realize how long environmental activism has been criminalized. 
It's not that no one's interested in solving these problems. It's that the people trying to solve them keep getting imprisoned and murdered. If you don't know about any of these events, you might be equally unaware what's been happening to people protesting the bulldozing of the Wilani Forest in Atlanta to build a police training center. You might be taken aback that they're being charged with terrorism for non-violent protest. The state wants to retain the power and legitimacy to do whatever it wants to you, including killing you for assembling peacefully, which, after all, is not allowed without a permit. The state doesn't debate, encourage, suggest, or submit proposals for your consideration. It demands, imposes, and enforces. If you resist, or just don't give up immediately, the state escalates. It will escalate to any level to subdue you. Now, depending what kind of movies you like to watch, the word resistance might conjure up images of militant reactionary terrorist groups who want to take over the government and kill everyone. We have this supposedly awesome democratic system and these evildoers want to kill people and impose a theocracy. So obviously we should overpower them. But what if the resistors just want to keep their land? What if they're defending their homes, their communities, and their freedom? Does the state make a distinction between the two types of groups? Or does it treat them all as terrorists? When the state decides you're a criminal, a terrorist, a radical, whatever the bad thing, it pursues you. The state doesn't negotiate unless it's forced to. And actually, that's why we have multiple countries in the world, because states couldn't expand any farther without prohibitively costly wars against other states, so they agreed to borders. Within those borders, states monopolize power, which means, among other things, there's only one form of justice allowed. If you don't agree with its justice, the state escalates. You don't want to move along? Police will arrest you. You don't want to be arrested? Police will attack you. You fight back, police will keep escalating, inviting more police to come, like in Rambo, until their target is neutralized. Because the state only knows how to escalate. It makes sense if you think about it. The state styles itself as this omnipotent force whose rule can't be disobeyed or it'll ruin your life. If it ever gave in, admitted weakness or ignorance, treated people as sovereign and able to make decisions for themselves, the illusion would shatter and people would realize they don't need the state. But instead, power escalates and the propaganda goes with it. You can see the logic of escalation play out in any aspect of life subjected to institutional power, because people with the most power want more, and will never compromise unless they're absolutely forced to, and would rather escalate the violence their rule is predicated on. That's why we live in such extreme times compared to any other time in history. States purport to rule every inch of the earth. Huge corporations span the globe and markets dictate the policy of nearly every government. Ecosystems are collapsing. Poverty is rising. More and more people rely on state welfare, but funds from those programs are progressively funneled towards police, military, surveillance, and other enforcers. We should expect more extreme behavior from more people. One form of escalation is growth. Capitalist states prioritize economic growth and tell us that's what we want too. The capitalist system compels corporations to grow by any means necessary, and the state is happy to clear the way for them. Growth tears down forests and kills its inhabitants. Growth crushes unions, suppresses wages, and cancels insurance. And we get subjected to news about how greedy unions are destroying this country and no one wants to work anymore. Growth strengthens the rule of those who take home the surplus. If you watch the news, you might hear about how these poor retail oligopolies suffer from shoplifting. Why do you think that might be? It's partly because prices keep rising. And what if you're not one of the lucky few with a juicy salary that keeps up with inflation? You might have to steal. So what should retailers do? Lower their prices? But how would that look on a quarterly report? If you only know how to escalate, the only answer that makes sense is to put locks and chains over the stuff people steal. The need for growth at any cost to life has had devastating effects. But if we don't know how to question what's going on, maybe because 
we only know the official side to the story. We don't see our problems as the result of the demand for growth, which, after all, is supposed to be a good thing. Look at borders and how they've escalated and why. Only a few generations ago, it was a piece of cake to go most places around the world. Now you have to fill out forms and pay fees and go through interviews and wait for months or years or forever, then get a full body scan before you're allowed to go to the place in the world you want. From having a porous border, the US has escalated to machines designed to kill migrants so they can't cross, cages to indefinitely detain anyone who does cross, and a large subculture that delights in hearing someone died trying to cross. In the US and EU, borders and their enforcement cause thousands of deaths a year. And it's all so some rich people can hire cheap labor. Things escalate when the people making money off the issue want more money. When someone makes money building prisons or from prison labor, we shouldn't be surprised there are more laws, more cops, more prisoners, and stronger borders. Because they mean more money for a few business owners. Since those targeted by police and border patrol are usually black and brown people, keeping prison numbers up requires racism. Things escalate when power-hungry people make promises to target the enemies they invented. The rhetoric might have started moderate, but it's never enough. So each time you need to say something worse, even if it's all a lie. And you have to do something more violent, even if it serves no goal other than to get you re-elected. Now, thanks to escalating rhetoric, something like 11 million people in the US alone admitted to surveyors in 2016 they were white nationalists and neo-Nazis. And the number of terrorist attacks by far-right perpetrators quadrupled in the US between 2016 and 2017, far-right attacks in Europe rose 43% over the same period. Nazism represents the ultimate escalation, the greatest concentration of power, the most extreme violence with the fewest pangs of conscience, commitment to the extermination of everyone deemed unworthy of life. State or other violence is justified, sometimes years in advance, by propaganda preparing the ground. The mainstreaming of fascism in our time has been fueled by racism, but also misogyny and transphobia, as we've seen in the recent passing of laws criminalizing abortion and gender transition. Stronger rhetoric justifies more cruelty, more oppressive laws, more egregious behavior toward migrants and criminals and poor people. But if you grow up in this time, it's not extreme, but normal. It's normal for us to see, for instance, people living and doing drugs in the street because all other space has been denied them. Isn't that extreme that these people have had all their possessions taken away and aren't even allowed a place to suffer alone? It doesn't seem extreme that we can send missiles around the world because we're scared people just minding their own business will kill us. What about having millions of people spend years of their lives in cages for taking things or selling drugs to someone who wanted to buy? It's only obvious they should lose all their freedom if we hold the extreme beliefs taught to us by the propaganda. We learn to trust the state, even to depend on it for truth and guidance. So whatever it does is justified. We get taught that whatever reasons the state gives for its existence in this time and place are the reasons why we need it. We used to need rulers to get in good with God. Now we need them to maintain order against people who just can't be trusted to be free. Either way, states escalate until they reach the amount of control they want, always retaining the threat to use extreme violence if anyone rocks the boat, while many of the rest of us just want to decentralize, to live independent of someone else's rule. But decentralization usually leads to re-centralization. How do we avoid that? Does history hold any lessons? All states are the result of conquest, or some other violent process of establishing a social hierarchy. Repression is the state's core function. During the golden age of imperialism and colonialism, the entire world was carved into states and colonies that would become states. In virtually every place conquered by an empire, there's been an independence movement. So on the one hand, we have an empire trying to centralize ever more power, but it's blocked by people who want independence. Many groups won their independence for a while, 
because they kicked out the colonizers. But then the successful movements became legitimate political parties. And once they had a taste of power, they forgot all about decentralization and independence. Decentralizing a post-colonial state should be easy in theory. When you kick out the empire, you can also dismantle and demolish the systems they installed and just let people secede and figure things out for themselves. But the people who took over the post-colonial states quickly realized it was in their interest to keep the colonial structures and live off their subjects. So while it would have been a relatively simple thing to let regions like Biafra, Katanga, East Timor, Kashmir, and Bangladesh secede from the central state, the state's response was escalation to civil war. The history of Israel is decades of tit-for-tat violence followed by escalation. We're now at the point where there are millions of people squeezed into a tiny plot of land where they can be easily bombed and starved whenever the Prime Minister's poll ratings drop. A set of Bantu stands that keep shrinking as people's homes and land are stolen from under their feet. And sadistic soldiers and civilians who mock their victims on social media. Eighty years after its creation in response to genocide, Israel is now committing one. Yet any violent reaction to this escalation gets labeled terrorism, because it always does. And any objection to the brutality of Israel or the US or Russia or whatever military is waging war on a civilian population gets called support for terrorism. In fact, you can get arrested for it now. Everyone who opposes your rampage is a terrorist, because anyone who poses a threat to the march of power is a terrorist. And now they're officially anti-Semites too. If you side with the powerful, you might choose to ignore or downplay the oppressive situation that made the terrorists mad because that was our side and we're the good guys. So our violence isn't so bad, certainly nothing to get violent about. The same logic of escalation and decentralization is playing out in the occupations of university campuses in solidarity with the victims of Israel's latest bout of mass murder. A decentralized student movement has formed and made demands of its universities. While some universities have made concessions, possibly recognizing it's the right thing to do, others have sent in the police, using tear gas and rubber bullets on students. After arresting them, the police denied some of them food and water, which is all part of terrorizing them into never questioning authority again. It's instructive to observe when and how police choose to intervene. In 2017, a mob of neo-Nazis marched around Charlottesville, North Carolina, attacking people they encountered, and the police did nothing. In 2024, Charlottesville police attacked and arrested students at a quiet anti-war protest. Sure, all the students want is for the university to divest from a state committing genocide, but letting people without institutional power make the decisions would weaken the authority of the institution. Give them an inch and they'll take a mile. There have been so-called counter-protests, i.e. civilians attacking students and faculty. Despite their claims, they are clearly not interested in stopping anti-Semitism. If they were, they would join the encampments. Because when you stand in solidarity with oppressed people in one place, you stand with oppressed people everywhere. Instead, they choose to ally themselves with power, to serve as its unpaid lapdogs, acting when and how people with power tell them to for whatever minor benefit they imagine it brings them. As rhetoric escalates, so does violence. This sitting city council person says it would be worth it to kill, or maybe just beat and cage, it's not clear, students and faculty, and raise? or maybe just fill with right-wing ideologues, the universities themselves. Moreover, consonant with the logic of escalating rhetoric, she claims they're leaving us no choice. We have to declare war on students protesting genocide because authority needs to assert legal control over every inch of soil under its jurisdiction. This rhetoric isn't new. Police attacking protesters and calling them terrorists has plenty of precedent. I don't want to go deep into the history of colonization, but this woman's thinking is very much in line with centuries of settlers before her. The European colonization of the Americas introduced millions of white people to an ecosystem they weren't familiar with. 
When they found out about something hurting their crops, they called it a pest and tried to exterminate it. Soon they started calling people pests and tried to exterminate them too. Over and over in US history, white people declared their intention to wipe out an entire tribe of people and take their land, and often they were successful. Instead of coexisting, they declared the natives savages, and the only good one was a dead one. This ideology is still very much alive in the US and Israel. On this channel, I mostly talk about the nature of social problems, so quite reasonably, people ask for solutions. I think solutions should flow logically from the nature of the problem they're solving, which is why understanding the problem is my priority. Our thinking about everything is imperfect, partly because no matter how much we know, we'll never know everything, but mostly because our knowledge is clouded by a lifetime of indoctrination. We need to unlearn our dependence on approval from authority, or we'll never be able to learn from the things authority disapproves of. Nothing's ever going to be realistic except what the people in power happen to be proposing. Sometimes solutions should be clear, we're just conditioned not to see them. As I explained in this video, the simplest and most obvious solution is often just not to do the thing. What's the solution to dropping bombs on innocent people? to not drop bombs on them, and failing that to stop the people doing it. Afraid of homeless people breaking into places and stealing stuff? Which do you think would be more effective at stopping them? More police and prisons, or giving people homes and basic incomes? You're paying for it either way, but you're less likely to be a victim yourself if others are taken care of. The solution to escalating is decentralizing, letting people be free to decide for themselves. So how would that work? If states only centralize and never decentralize, and if so many civilians have an authoritarian mindset, how do we establish a free society? There are lots of possible paths. Last week I recommended reading Mariam Kaba, and this is me repeating myself, because she and her contemporaries present some of those paths. Kaba's priority is reducing, with an eye to eliminating, the power of police and the so-called justice system and returning that power to the community. This paragraph is a window into how that might start. We can begin, as many communities have, by focusing on removing police from specific tasks, arenas, and spaces, such as mental health crisis response, traffic enforcement, and schools. We can eliminate the police units, weaponry, and individual cops who are doing the most harm, including street crime units, homeless outreach units, vice squads, anti-protest units, party patrols, canine and mounted units, militarized equipment, and surveillance tools. We can prioritize termination of cops with violent track records, as we shrink the size, reach, and power of police departments, while simultaneously recognizing that the problem extends beyond individuals. We can divest from police departments and invest in meeting individual and community needs like housing, health care, education, and youth programs. In community-based non-police violence prevention, interruption, and transformative justice programs, our ultimate goal must be abolition of all forms of surveillance, policing, and punishment, and the systems that require them if we're to achieve true public safety. I like the focus on the police, but there are plenty of other things that can be done. There are a lot of people talking about using technology to aid in our liberation, maybe by developing decentralized systems that anyone can use and access, maybe a bit like Wikipedia or the Fediverse. There's so much potential for decentralized mutual aid systems on the internet. We have the infrastructure for a website to get anything to anyone, but it's owned for profit, so control over it is centralized in the hands of a few managers and directors. If we had a website for getting resources from people who have them to people who don't without the need for money to change hands, we would have a mutual aid system. Unlearning our belief in social hierarchy means unlearning patriarchy, white supremacy, ableism, and other authoritarian ideologies buried in our minds. As we become self-sufficient and self-governing, as we learn to treat each other better, we won't depend on states and corporations anymore and can live as free people. Yes, societies with no state, no slavery, no poverty, where people respect each other's autonomy, they still exist, even in such extreme times as these. You can learn about some examples of them in this video, or wait until my next video, when I'll be going into more detail. 
Here's one example to keep you busy. The Rojava region of northern Syria went independent in the wake of the Syrian revolt of 2011. Rojava is organized as a confederated system of communes with emphasis on women's rights and ecology. People sign up for committees for things like health and dispute resolution. Since everyone makes and enforces them, the rules don't reflect the exercise of power, but the political equality of everyone. There's no police force. Everyone learns community defense. Those charged with security are elected by the community they serve, and the delegates rotate, so everyone's involved and accountable to each other. By the way, I'm getting all this from a link you can find in the description. There's no doubt the self-organized society would have its hands full defending itself from states and empires. Rojava's been doing it for years now, and they're still growing strong. If you need more examples of decentralized forces defending themselves against a centralized one to know that it's possible, I refer you to centuries of stateless German tribes defending themselves from the Roman Empire, centuries of successful Apache resistance to European colonization, and decades so far of Zapatista autonomy in Chiapas. Decentralization has been integral to their success because it's impossible to hijack a decentralized movement. To this day, there are millions of people living in free societies. It's possible to stay free indefinitely. If you think it's worth it, let's make it happen. So how could we apply the principles of decentralization to the question of Palestine? There are currently three basic ideas circulating on how to approach resolving the conflict and ending Israel's colonization of the Palestinian people. They are, in order of popularity, the two-state solution, the one-state solution, and the no-state solution. Two states would mean both Israel and Palestine were their own nation-states, presumably along the lines proposed in UN Resolution 242. Hamas and Fatah more or less agree on a form of two-state solution, as do many peace activists around the world. I have a number of problems with this model. One mistake many well-meaning people make is in their beliefs about the state, that it protects and represents them. So if Palestinians had a state of their own, they would no longer be considered terrorists, but legitimately defending themselves. And they could have a military that could match that of Israel's. The thing is, the most democratic of states can be taken over by people who don't serve the people's interest. A decentralized system is robust, while hierarchical systems like states get taken over by the people with the most money. Sure, they would be Palestinian, but they would get bought out by foreign diplomats and business people. Or if they didn't play ball, they might get assassinated. A new state might just spell the newest reason Palestinians can't be free. A one-state solution might be slightly more realistic. After all, there is one state right now, Israel. If it accepted all Palestinians in the occupied territories as legal citizens and gave them the same theoretical rights as Israelis, the conflict would de-escalate, at least at first. However, many Israelis are afraid of what might happen if Jews lose their majority in Israel. Not even necessarily of revenge, but just losing relative power over political affairs and having to give back land. Finally, we come to the no-state solution, which means no Palestinian state, but liberation from all states. Feel free to protest, that's not what most Palestinians want. I'm not here to tell anyone how to think. It's just another idea floating around. It's not on the table, because no solution is on the table. That doesn't mean it's not worth even considering. No state in Palestine might look something like in Rojava. People empowered to defend, educate, and take care of each other, and to make decisions together in a confederation of communes. But no one can create stable systems of governance if they're under constant bombardment, if their homes are being blown up and their friends are being killed or arrested every day. Our most immediate concern should be ending the war on Palestine, letting people eat and breathe. The violence in Palestine is not unique or unprecedented or unpredictable. It's a result of wanting power over others. The violence in post-colonial states is not incomprehensible. It's what happens when you fear losing power. But there's nothing inevitable about any of this. We don't need to be ruled by other people who don't care about us. We don't need money and property and police to have a society. In fact, those things mark the substitution of society for hierarchy. We can create self-governing communities and join those around the world living free.